Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show with Jason Hartman. You're about to learn a new slant on investing, some exciting techniques, and fresh new approaches to the world's most historically proven asset class that will enable you to create more wealth and freedom than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made multimillionaire who's actually been there and done it. He's a successful investor, lender, developer, and entrepreneur who's owned properties in 11 states, had hundreds of tenants and been involved in thousands of real estate transactions. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to your financial independence day. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome, everybody, and good morning, good morning, wherever you are in the world. This is Jason Hartman, and I've got Adam here with us, and the gold color already says, good morning, you are so fast. Wow, that took like 10 seconds to get the first good morning. Post your questions and comments. If you like, we will try to get to all of them. This is, rather than our normal coffee talk that we do on Sundays, this is a little bit more of a, uh, a presentation, a podcast episode for, and I believe we're on episode 1557, if I'm not mistaken. And I wanted to talk today about the booming southeastern real estate market. And just, you're going to be astonished because Adam has put together some slides and some info, and it is just going to amaze you <laughs> at the inventory statistics. The inventory statistics will blow your mind. Are you ready to have your mind blown? Adam, are you ready to blow some minds? Oh yeah, let's do it. This is this is my mind, which is why I put the slides together. Yeah, good. Well, hey, before we start, I just want to remind everybody that real estate is the ideal investment. Income property is the ideal investment. Why? Because as it says on the screen, it offers income, depreciation, equity growth, appreciation, and leverage. It's a multi-dimensional asset class. And what drives me crazy, and Adam, I bet it drives you crazy too, is that, you know, we, when you're on YouTube, by the way, you get some just wacko comments, <laughs> like people that you, you can really tell sometimes, like, what are these people thinking? I know it's present company excluded. But you know, you always get some comments. Oh, you're crazy to be talking about real estate right now. Real estate is going to crash. It's going to collapse. The economy is falling apart. That's not completely false, <laughs> but it's mostly false. There, there's some truth to it for sure. I get it. You know, we do not live in a bubble here, folks. We know what's going on in the world. I'm constantly reporting what's going on in the world. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. It's a multi-dimensional asset class. And the culture of the entire world seems to be stuck in this one-dimensional asset thinking, which is buy low, sell high. That's it. Buy low, sell high. Folks, that's only one part of our return on investment compilation here, right? It's a multi-dimensional asset class. And of course, we've talked about market timing, which is a fool's errand, a fool's <laughs> errand. Adam, go ahead. Speak. I was going to say market timing makes most people do the one dimensional asset of buy high, sell below. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're right. That market timing usually does lead to that. But I want to even compare it to successful market timing, which is <laughs> so rare. It is extremely, extremely rare. But even with successful market timing, it still doesn't win the strategy of just buy good properties and hold on for the long term. That's the winning strategy. So anyway, this is just a reminder that income property is, of course, the ideal investment. And remember that acronym IDEAL, I-D-E-A-L, income, depreciation, equity growth, appreciation, and leverage. And by the way, for those new to income property investing in the most historically proven asset class in the entire world, when I say depreciation, I mean that in a good way, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's good. Depreciation is the world's best tax benefit. 
It is a phantom write-off. It is a non-cash write-off. It's a tax benefit you get without writing a check to get voodoo depreciation. Voodoo depreciation. Yeah, voodoo voodoo depreciation. I like it. I like it. That's good. All right. So let's dive into Adam's content here. And uh, of course, welcome. If you have any questions, reach out to us through jasonhartman.com. If you're in the United States watching or listening, call us at 1-800-HARTMAN and we can get you there. Adam, so here is a map. Now, this is a a photo. <laughs> what are you? Are you reading the newspaper? Or I read a movie? physical book. Can you believe this? I read a physical book. <laughs> yeah, a physical book. Okay, so a book on what is that? Is that made of paper? This is, uh, this is friend of the show, John Burns's uh, yeah. The Big Shift that yeah. he gave out at the Meet the Masters back, I think, two years ago. Right. And I finally got around to actually reading it. Um, ah, you know. Slacker. Slacker. <laughs> well, it wasn't on Kindle. It takes a while. Oh, oh so so in other words, if it's on a, uh, if it's an ebook on a Kindle or some other device, then you read it more quickly than you read a physical yeah. book. Yeah, I would but say no, that's probably true. No, that's and why is that? I don't know. Just ease of use, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> All right. So, what does this tell us? What does this uh, map photograph yeah. tell us? This map of the United States as so a one photo. Of, one of the big things they were talking about is household growth. Um, you know, as people, move, you know, we've talked about and you've talked about on the show how people are still living with their parents, moving back in with them. And when they go out, they form new households. They're not new people, but they're forming new households. So household growth is both people moving out for the first time and people moving out for the second time and, you know, divorces happening and creating new households. And this is showing where people have been forming households in terms of demographically, where they're moving. And if you look here, you actually have the Southeast and then Texas and Florida throw everything off so much they have to make their own category for them. Yeah, wow. Because wow. the Southeast, where we have a lot of our investing um, portfolios that we're building up for people, that grew at 33% as opposed to, you know, your California was 21. If you look here, your Northeast is only 13%. So everything's growing because we're getting more people. But if you look at the pace of growth, the Southeast is growing at over, it looks like it's about one and a quarter times faster. So 25% faster than the rest of the country. And Texas and Florida are nearly double the rest of the country. I mean, this is why when we talk about the cyclical markets in the, you know, the West Coast and the Northeast, when we talk about the hybrid markets and the linear markets, this Southeast stuff, a lot of that is the linear markets and you're still outgrowing the rest of the country. It's incredible. You know, what's what's interesting about this, it you know, that it's just a sort of a broad takeaway from this map. And by the way, thank you for getting this together because it's it's really interesting. One of the broad takeaways would be that the money is it's you know what I was saying 16, 17 years ago. The I call it the water theory of money, right? You know, you've got this water bottle, you you pour it out, and what does the water do, right? The old saying is water seeks its own level. And and so the water flows to the lowest point. And you know, this this shows you that that's happening because these lower priced markets, the business friendly areas of the country, the right to work states, mostly where you don't, you're not forced at gunpoint to join a union. And if you want to get a job, <laughs> the most ridiculous idea ever, that's where the lion's share of the growth is. Now, what's interesting is that, like you said, Texas and Florida get their own separate category. They're not even regionalized. <laughs> They're so big. Texas, 47% yeah. household formation growth. Florida, 45%. Yeah. You're in Texas. I'm in Florida. I used to live in the Socialist Republic of California at yeah. only 21%. So Texas, more than double. Florida, more than double California. And these are more than triple what's happening in the expensive Northeastern markets, mm -hmm. all business, mostly business unfriendly. So yeah. it, it really shows you just the general vibe, right? The vibe. How's that for a technical term <laughs> of what people are thinking and what they're doing? Yeah. Now the Southwest grew the fastest. So I'll admit that. But for the most part, if you look at those states, those are states that don't make sense at the moment. So it'd be great if we could get into the Southwest, but you know, we just, we can't. Yeah. And so what Adam means by that is that, you know, if you can't get a good rent to value ratio on the properties, 
then we're not going to be interested in those markets. You know, the Southwest is great, but again, it got too expensive. Many times over the years, we've been in and out of the greater Phoenix metro area uh, because there were times when that market did make sense and you could get a reasonable rent-to-value ratio. But again, most of those markets just don't work. So, you know, we got to go where it makes sense, where the growth is. And this is really interesting. You did allude to divorce, and I just want to talk about the D word for a moment. I've mentioned this over the years on the podcast. One of the things that I I want you to consider, now this is a little bit conspiratorial, I'm going to admit, (laughs) but just think about it. If you have a country, right, and you want the economy to grow, or if you have a company, a major company, right, and you want to grab more market share, right, for your <laughs> consumer products, if you have a consumer, yeah, Adam, you know what I'm going to say because you're chuckling at this, right? It, but it's it's really true, you know. If you sell sofas, coffee makers, refrigerators, toasters, whatever, right, and or, or if you're a home builder and you sell houses and If you're in government and say you're the president of the country or you're Congress or or whatever, right? You're a congressperson. Dare I say, don't say congressman, say congressperson. Thank you. Uh, PC here. You know, think about it. If you want the economy to increase in size or if you want your market share to increase in size, you should discourage marriage and you should encourage divorce, Because think about it, when someone isn't married, or if they are married in one household, and then they become divorced, you've literally doubled your demand for whatever your product is, right? If you sell toasters, now you got to have two toasters because you have two households. You got to have two sofas because you have two households. You've got to have two coffee makers because you got two households. Whereas a husband and wife living in one household can just have one of those things and they can both use them. So this is this is literally double the market size, right? And, and an economy where 70% of the economy is based on consumer consumption. 70% of the S&P 500 is just consumer, right? This is giant. It's huge. You know, talk about a way to stimulate the economy. Tell people to stay single or tell them not or tell them to get divorced. And this sucks. This is bad for society. It's bad for culture. It's bad in so many ways sociologically. But the powers that be, the greedy powers that be, the po- politicians that want things to look better on their watch during their tenure, and the, the big corporatocracy that wants to make more money, you have to admit that this would be a part of their strategy, right? Uh, and so they want Hollywood to make divorce more acceptable. They want Hollywood to discourage the idea of marriage. And so you see all these movies that like subtly reflect all of this stuff. And it's just interesting, you know, because uh, this is an increase in market share for for companies. There's just no question about it. Adam, you're married. You got four kids. Comment. (laughs) Uh, Thanks for that happy, happy view of, uh, of life and society. Right, right. Hey, listen, I'm I'm not here to make you happy. I'm here to make you money. <laughs> and by understanding the trends, uh, you can make money. Yeah. But uh, hopefully now, happiness will result. <laughs> now, this chart is what has actually happened. This was 1990 to 2010. So this has already happened. If you go to the next okay. slide, we're going to yeah. see what they're expecting to happen. And this one is even better for us as investors. All right. If you look at this again, the Southeast is actually going to outperform Texas and Florida, and it's going to grow at 24%. And they're expecting household growth to grow, I think it was somewhere in like the 15 or 16% um, over the next 10 years. So this is their guess. The book at the time was written in 2015 for 2016 through 2025. So Texas is still growing 15%. Florida is at 12%, and the Southeast is at 24%. That is all higher than any other part of the nation. It's hard. And on the left, we start breaking it down into areas. Right. Like we've talked about, you've got your urban, your suburban, and your rural. 
And right. if you look and what's, at- what's, what's interesting, Adam, here is I'll bet you, you know, when we look at the 2010 to 15 and the 2015 to 2025, those are projections. Okay. So, well, you know, oh, yeah. you can, you can lop a few percentage points for sure <laughs> off of the urban growth and just put that as in into the suburban share of the market, I think, right? Yeah. I mean, they were predicting it to go up to 21% urban because people were moving, you know, older people who wanted to, well, not older necessarily, but people, empty nesters who wanted to move into where there were more amenities. And then you've got the younger people moving out, wanting to stay in the urban areas. But then as they get older, they start to move back out to the suburbs, you know, for the, they have kids and they move back out there. So they actually saw the urban dropping from 26, from 2015 to 2025. And that has definitely happened. So you're looking at potentially 79% of the growth happening in suburbia. That's where you're able to make it work. That's where we're able to, to find properties is yeah. suburbia is growing. And this was before the pandemic. Right, so I would right. say you could even drop probably four to five percent off urban because I don't see many people moving there. I don't hear any of my friends talking about moving to the downtown core. But I've seen friends looking for properties in suburbia. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. So well, now, now, just uh, just to be uh, a fair analyst and statistician on that, you know, you're in the age group where there's a lot of family formation. So your friends, True. if they're single, they're more likely to live in an urban area than if they're married, right? So yeah. you got to adjust for that a little <laughs> bit. But I totally agree with you. My friends who are single and married. Nobody's talking about moving to New York City, okay? Yeah. Uh, nobody's talking about that. Nobody's talking about moving to downtown LA or the more dense areas of LA or San Diego or Seattle or anything like that. And as I tried to post yesterday, but Facebook was censoring me, which is <laughs> totally freaking ridiculous. You know, this these social media companies and their censorship is... Very bad news. And, um, you know, I, I posted that link from the Justice Department website about how they have literally declared New York, Portland, and Seattle to be anarchy zones, <laughs> in essence, right? Uh, so uh, this is this is absolutely crazy. Yeah, And this is completely anecdotal, but I think I, t I don't remember if I said it on a stream or a show before, if I just said it talking to you. And here in Austin, Whenever we moved here, the market was hot. People were going crazy trying to buy in the suburban area we are. And then it died down. And then just when the pandemic hit, I started getting text messages from my realtor saying, hey, if you see any coming soon, tell me. Because once they hit the MLS, they're, it's gone. You know, they're, they're snapped up. There's so much competition. When you say if you see any coming but, soon, you're talking about houses hitting the market. Houses for sale. But if there are any homes in your suburban neighborhood that are coming soon, let me know. I have people who want to buy them right now. Yeah. yeah. And you know what it reminded me of? It reminded me of all the new construction that we're selling that are, aren't even built yet, but people are lining up to get. Yeah. Some of our clients are, are literally have, have purchased properties now or signed up to purchase properties that won't be delivered until early 2021. That's me. 21. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, it's it's just uh, unbelievable. Yeah, it's uh, the demand is absolutely staggering. Now, I know there are people out there who are saying, oh, the end of the world's coming. But uh, I don't know. I don't know that it's coming. Even at the end of the world, people need a place to live. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, well, they need it more so. And we discovered that during the pandemic because uh, people home became the center of the universe, as I said. Uh, so we got a couple. Uh, feel free to make some comments here, folks. We can get a couple questions, comments in. Uh, so good morning, Tony. Good morning, Gold Color. Good morning, Robert uh, from Michigan. Again, yes, tell us where you're located, by the way. And we, we got to always ask, Robert, where on the hand are you located? You know, Michigan's like a hand, right? So, you know, point there. <laughs> that's what that's what Michiganders always do, right? And then Metal Bum says, uh, hey there, good morning. Okay, so let's go to the next slide, Adam. Yeah, so this one is looking at mortgage rates versus home prices. And it's no surprise to, and home affordability, sorry. And it's not going to come as a surprise to listeners of the show. Interest rates have dropped dramatically and it lowers the payments and it causes the home affordability to start going up. But then what happens is Jason home affordability goes up. So everybody wants to buy. 
<laughs> yep. So, it so you have you out. have no supply. <laughs> yeah. And now this was also remember this was 2015. That first line down there, I don't know if y'all can see it. The line where the blue lines around, that's six percent. We're not at six percent anymore. Yeah. We're at the bottom of this graph. Right. We're at four percent now. That's so amazing. so as you were talking about people buy based on payments, not price. As it goes down, it's showing you right here, as the payments get lower, home affordability gets higher. And that's even more important as this line goes lower and lower and closer to zero. So and home word, affordability is high. Great point, Adam. And the, the word of caution here is the media deceives you. Oh, imagine that. Really? <laughs> Nobody's surprised that the media would deceive us, right? Nobody trusts the media anymore, the mainstream media, or as Sarah Palin used to call it, the lamestream media. I love that, by the way. Uh, that's good. But the lamestream media, this isn't some big political conspiracy. It's just that they have to talk in sound bites because, you know, there's a very short amount of time that they can talk and explain anything. And uh, so, you know, what you see here is virtually every discussion in the media and the mainstream media is home prices, you know, and you, they'll show you a home price chart. You'll be looking at CNBC. They'll put a chart on the screen. It'll say home prices are as high or higher now than they were at the prior peak. And look what happened then there was a big, <laughs> you know, crash folks that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't tell the story. Why? Because of course, Real estate is a multi-dimensional asset class. And as Adam just explained, nobody buys a house based on the price. They buy it based on the payment. That is the true cost of the home ownership, the monthly cost, not the overall cost. Folks, if everybody was so concerned about the overall cost, they would be wondering, you know, why houses still aren't $60,000 like they were decades ago. The interest rates are dramatically lower and they're buying based on that monthly payment. The other uh, point of caution I want to give you is that, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, the interest rate went from 6% to 3%. So it went down 3%. No, it did not go down 3%. It went down by 50%. OK, so just when you when you look at these charts, realize, of course, that's the comparison. It's not a it's not a three percent change. It's a 50 percent change. Remember, the question is, as my followers have dubbed it, the Jason Hartman question compared to what? Right. So you have to compare that old interest rate with the new interest rate. And you see there, you know, in that example, 50% reduction. So yeah, Adam, that's that's staggering. And and by the way, I shared on one of the others an example of a 2006 mortgage at the interest rates then. Today buys you, uh, that was a $100,000 mortgage in that example I gave before. I don't have it on the screen right now. But now you can get a $170,000 mortgage approximately for the same monthly cost. That's the issue, right? You're getting $70,000 more, 70% 70 more buying power for the same monthly payment. It's truly incredible. And so this next chart is as we're talking about monthly payments, this is, you know, people want to get their housing costs in that 30 to 40% range. So this is showing us as the, and this is from July, it goes up to July of this year. And it shows you that as the interest rates have dropped, and this is when the interest rate had gone down to 2.98%, which it's still hovering right around. I heard that it went up to 2.87 um, recently. And it shows that the home affordability is so great that your payment, the average payment is only 19.8% of income. Anybody, pretty much anybody who can afford a down payment can afford a home right now. Okay, now, Adam, this is good, and I want to make a comparison. I want to do a compared to what on this one, okay? I'm so glad you brought this chart, so great job. Let's give Adam a hand, everybody. He's got it. I wish that clapping would not go so long. 
<laughs> you know, I need a sound effect machine with a shorter clap. <laughs> okay. But but Adam, Adam wearing his rugby shirt there, just like you want a rugby match, right? Not a game, a match. Match, yep. All right. Yeah. See, I got the correct terminology. You've won the rugby match here on the affordability thing. And here's why. Okay. Think about the arbitrage. You know, I talk a lot about arbitrage and I like to give things simplistic definitions. So arbitrage, you know, the simplistic way to understand that important word is exploiting the differences in things. That's what arbitrage is. You're exploiting the differences in things. Okay. So think about this arbitrage. You buy a property and that property is a 19% for the you know payment to income ratio. But when you rent a property, when you take that same property and rent it, I'll bet you that your tenants are paying a 33 to 40% rent to income ratio, okay? That's what they're, 30, 30 to 40% is typically what the renter is going to pay. And with that in mind, and this is not new for my regular followers, but I just got to say it again because it's so important. Look at folks, indentured servitude is illegal. <laughs> Slavery is illegal. I, okay. I hate this example. <laughs> yeah, You hate this example. Okay. I think this example is a good one. But if you want indentured servitude, then all you need to do is buy a bunch of properties and get your tenants to agree, agree of their own free will. Okay. They're, they're agreeing. They're not forced to simply agree to share 30 to 40% of their total household income with you every single month. So think about that. You know, a lot of people think, okay, well, I want to go into business. I want to get rich in business and I want to start a business. And one of the things you're really doing in business is you're arbitraging, right? So in a professional services firm, it's an easy example to use. Accounting firm, law firm, management consulting firm, whatever, right? And so typically you'll hire people and you'll pay them, you know, X amount of dollars per hour. Say they're professionals and, you know, just in this example, they make $50 an hour. That's what you pay them. But when you bill them out to a client, you charge the client $200 an hour. So, you know, it's literally a, a four times markup, right? That's kind of the pretty typical. Sometimes it's even greater. I have one friend that works at a, a big tax and management consulting firm, and she gets billed out at insane rates, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars an hour, almost a thousand dollars an hour, because she has this very specialized knowledge when it comes to tax nexuses and strategies for that. But she gets paid like a tenth of that. <laughs> it's crazy what they, they, the arbitrage they get there, right? And so basically what you're doing is, is you're saying to your tenant, okay, instead of having an employee, y- your tenant is just going to work for 10 to 14 days of every month to pay you. That's what goes to your rent. 10 to 14 days of of the first 10 to 14 days of every month that your tenant works is yours. That's your rental income. So it's pretty amazing. It really is. It really is. And I, sorry if you don't like my example, but it's just reality. Oh, I, I pref- the indentured servitude is better than when you drop the, the slave. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, listen, you know, there's, look, look, there's no secret. I mean, you know, many people have accused the Federal Reserve and the U.S. government or all governments around the world and the big corporations, the corporatocracy of making everyone into a debt slave. You know, it's the student loan scam, which is a total freaking scam of epic proportions. It's one point five trillion with a T, you know, it's a, it's $1.5 trillion or so in student loan debt slavery. I call it the government student loan debt slavery complex. It's absolutely disgusting. You know, they're selling these largely worthless degrees too. <laughs> Not all of them. STEM degrees are very worthwhile, of course, but a lot of these degrees that they're selling are, are a scam. This will be continued on the next episode. Thank you for listening and happy investing. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, heartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own, and if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Episode.